Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Interviews with Fabrizio Lazarde. Today, we have another interesting guest. It's Rosamira Guillén from Proyecto TT in Colombia. Welcome, Rosamira. It's awesome to have you. Hi, Fabrizio. It's a great pleasure to be uh, talking to you today. And my best uh, wishes to everyone in the audience who is listening to our stories today. Thanks, Rosamira. My best wishes to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I gotta say that Projecto TT and but not only Projecto TT, especially you, you have been a symbol of conservation success in all Latin America for all for all young conservationists and from for other conservationists internationally. So What can you tell us about you, Rosamira? How did you start in conservation? Or, yes, what inspired you to protect endangered animals? Well, Fabrizio, yes, it is it's quite an interesting uh, pathway that I have followed because uh, everybody assumes that I'm a, either a biologist or veterinary or somebody in the uh, natural sciences, but no, I was actually trained as an architect of all things. And um, I wanted to design spaces, but I had a lot of interest for outdoor spaces, for natural places and parks and outside, just outside Landscape. because I just love, yeah. yes, just like I love the, the environment. So I ended up getting a scholarship to get my master's in landscape architecture in the United States, a Fulbright scholarship. And when I came back to Colombia, My first job was at the zoo, at the Barranquilla Zoo. Barranquilla is a large city in northern Colombia, where yes. I was born and raised. The capital of so, the Atlantico Department. Exactly. Yes. One of the, it's the largest city in the, in the Caribbean region of Colombia, just by the sea, right? And, well, my first job was to remodel. Uh, the zoo was really, really in bad shape. And um, when I got to the exhibit of this cute little cotton top tamarind it was just it was definitely love at first sight I really I had to do research on each species that I was going to build an exhibit for so I had to research on cotton tops and I realized they're only found in this very little corner of Colombia and that amazed me and the fact that I didn't know when I, I was born and raised here and I never heard of this I said this is ridiculous we need to do something about it And of all things, I ended up becoming the director of that zoo a few years after. And then that's when I took like a big shift from landscape architecture to wildlife conservation wow. and learned a lot in the zoo, made cotton tops be our like a key species and then got connected with Proyecto Titi. And yeah, that's that's been since then. Uh, the the life mission to increase awareness to protect uh, cotton tops just because they are an amazing critically endangered species that deserves our attention especially us Colombians so that's in a nutshell the story <laughs> well I, I gotta say that's simply amazing I, I mean like all that that extreme I would say change of your life like going from architect to wildlife conservationist but you know that we do need architects to be conservationists too for example there are many zoos in in north america in europe in which there are companies of architects and engineers only working to design better exhibits better places in I mean like yeah spaces in those zoos and that's pretty good also yes. what oh yeah go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh sorry continue continue and then I go. no I was just, I was just gonna say that's exactly what happened to me when you know by doing research and learning and visiting other zoos and visiting natural areas where the animals were in the wild it was it was an excellent connection and just like you're saying Fabrizio We need architects and engineers and everybody to be environmentally minded to do a better job in protecting wildlife. A, a, a wildlife conservation and in, in nature, it touches everything in our lives. So it needs to be a factor into consideration for every profession we do. So that is that is very true what you're saying. Exactly. And and well, 
Yeah, not only that, but your passion for the cotton top tamarind. <laughs> that's something that simply amazes me. You know, like how you saw them for the first time after never hating about them and then devoting your life to saving them and to work for them. That's, that's a very inspiring story. And I hope that many of my viewers will like it and will comment. And please let us know what you think about Rosamira's story and the Project TT project with the cotton top tamarind. So, well, uh, Rosamira, since you work with Project TT, what have you seen? I mean, like, um, when you first arrived, what was the situation with the cotton top tamarind? Were they more yeah. critically endangered than what they are now, or they have been in? They are now in better shape than when you arrived, or what were your first experiences in projected? Yes. So I learned about cotton tops about twenty years ago, and while I was at the zoo, and in through that pathway, I met Dr. Ann Savage. She's a, a United States biologist that came to Colombia when she was doing her PhD dissertation to study cut and tops. And she founded Project TTT more than 30 years ago. Uh, when I met her, she had a very small team, mostly doing research and uh, environmental education in around the forested areas. But I fell in love with the species, with the project, and started collaborating from the zoo. But when I came and I joined uh, Project TTT over 13 years ago, fully dedicated to this, uh, I really wanted to bring up the profile and create awareness for cotton tops. And the first thing we did together was to uh, present the real situation of cotton tops as critically endangered because the species was designated as, um, as endangered and in, in Colombia it was vulnerable. So a species that only is found in Colombia and in Colombia was vulnerable, so very low uh, risk, right? Internationally, it was endangered, but we did a first population survey and realized that there were about 7,000 cotton tops in the wild, only in 2% of the forest. So we said, this is by all means critically endangered. That was our first um, achievement to get the Colombian authorities to recognize that the situation was really drastic and also the international community. So we accomplished that. And then came a big airport that wanted to be built in one of our reserves that we're protecting. And we fought that and that was another big achievement, right? But then after that, we have working in, in getting cotton tops in everybody's mind in Colombia or in the region, at least the authorities, companies, and then associated with the beautiful ecosystem where they live, which is a tropical dry forest of Northern Colombia. So we are getting ready to do a third population survey next year. So we will see what has changed in those 10 years, but and we will have you know, hard data to confirm you know, what had happened with the population and with the forest. Of course, we hope, fingers crossed, that it shows an increase as a, as a result of very tough 10 years of working for the species. But one thing we know, and we're for sure, is that People recognize cotton tops, they know it's endangered, and they know it's only Colombia, which is part of what we wanted to achieve. We do this through the interviews and you know, uh, releases in press and participation in many events. We know now that people are, um, you know, are understanding this is not like when I saw him for the first time that I had no idea what that was. <laughs> I thought it was coming from, from some exotic place and it was in my backyard, you know? So we gained a lot with regards to awareness, education, involvement. You know, we used to be five people when I joined Proyecto TT. We're now a team of 30. It wow. used to have just one little location. We have three locations now. And many, many more partnerships with organizations, private organizations, nonprofit, uh, government organizations. So we have grown as an organization and we're yet to see Next year, hopefully, what has happened with the population, trusting that all of that has had a very positive impact in the population of cotton tops. So, wow, that's that's exciting, Rosamira. You, you know, like um, from the start, 
to now all that you've achieved and not only that but you are making the Conan Top Tamarind an emblem of Colombia, an emblem that all people should should try to conserve and should try to embrace because at the end, like you mentioned, it is only found in Colombia in a small portion. Hopefully, if the conservation measures continue and involvement from the people, they could expand the range. Am I right? Yeah, depending. I mean, what, what we want, at least for the next 10 years, let's say, is that there's more forest. If there's more forest, population can grow and then we can stabilize to a point where, where we say we're safe now. You know, and, and that is in balance with the needs of humans. You know, we know we need to have cattle ranches and agricultural fields and mining and urban development, but that doesn't mean that we cannot balance it out and have some forest and some development. Exactly. That's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to, to under, we're trying to work under that vision that forests are interconnected, cotton tops have enough um, uh, forest to live on and within their life cycle and people can profit get their you know fields feed their families and the government can do their thing and each one can do the thing without destroying the other and um, that would yes. be a win-win situation for both the species the ngo environmentalists and the people yeah and and you know now that you mentioned this here in panama in well not in all but in some of them in areas that are, I don't know, primate or big cat habitats, mm -hmm. well, if they are private land from, I mean, like from people, yeah, cattle ranches or cultural lands, sometimes the farmers or the ranchers destinate, mm -hmm. like, for example, if they are two parcels or two, uh, ect I don't know how to say it, like mm, hectares or yeah. hectares, yeah. Yeah, and Hector, yeah. they designate one of them or a part of it to be the forest, to be, you know, leave it like that. So the animals can cross through, mm -hmm. through the forest, through that. And it will be like kind of a bridge, you know, like. And at the same time, they would be producing like exactly. by cattle and they don't disturb the forest or a part exactly. of it. Exactly. Exactly. That is exactly the, the model we're implementing here in Colombia. It's a very popular model that is being implemented in many places, Fabrizio. Yes. So we have learned from our colleagues, especially in Brazil. We visited a few projects there that were with monkeys as well. And I know in Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, there's many experiences that have been successful. And that's exactly what we're trying to do within the area where we work, is work with farmers. They we make conservation agreements and they agree to save that part of the forest to use as a bridge or as, or as a forest highway <laughs> for the monkeys. And they, they change some practices and habits to sustainably farming and cattle ranching. They get what they need. We get what we need. Monkeys get what they need. And it's a win-win, just like you're saying. And, um, and especially for, for species like cotton tops, they never come down to the ground. They're always, you know, 10 to 15, uh, you know, feet above the ground. Uh, so they need continuous force to move around. And if they don't have it, it's like if we were with our family in an island and then we don't know how to swim, we don't have a boat and we don't have any food. And you see the, the next island in front of you with lots of food and you cannot get there, you know? So it's like, it's like you get, you're confined and cannot move around. That's what's happening to cotton tops because whatever's left of the forest is just little islands that are disconnected. Mm -hmm. So exactly that's part of the work we're doing with the farmers, with the communities uh, beyond education and, and research. Uh, but that is exactly what we want to achieve. Find the balance and, and it's good for humans, it's good for the monkeys. And, and by the way, Rosamira, as you said, all of this, that they cannot, that they stay in the treetops all the mm -hmm. time. What happens if, for example, this happens? If they yeah. are in a, a small patch of forest, they are trapped there and the food ends, what 
they can go to the ground, but they are more susceptible to the threat. Yes. I mean, like. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They don't, they don't like it. If you see a cotton top on the ground, that means he, he or she is under, you know, a lot of stress and has no choice and is basically, you know, trying to survive. But their safe place is not even in the treetops, Fabito. It's a little below that because they are predated by uh, raptor birds. So, and, and also by boa snakes and small mammals. So they try to stay, they're very smart. They try to stay in the middle, not to expose to raptor birds, not to expose to boa snakes or, or, or mammals. <laughs> and they kind of hang out in there. But yes, what happens is that it's like if you are with your mom and dad and your siblings in one island for 200 years, you, you have no way to, I mean, maybe you can reproduce among the family, but that would be genetically very disturbing for your species. Exactly. And then you at some point you run out of food. Or if you are a few families and you start reproducing, then you don't have enough space. It's like if you bring more and more people into your home, at some point you're just not going to have a bed for everybody and that's what happens with the monkeys and that is is the same situation for many other wildlife species so what we want is to have the opportunity to get on that forest highway and go somewhere else to find food to find a mate to find a territory for your life so that's that's exactly the importance of connectivity and that's why so many organizations around the world are working in restoring the forest and creating those corridors, which is a big part of our work right now. And not only that, Rosamira, but the genetic bottleneck you mentioned, mm -hmm. it can be, it can end a species because if, for yes. example, the species keeps inbreeding and inbreeding, there will be a moment when they are so inbred that, well, they lose lost. their abilities yep. and, and, you know, it, it's very dangerous. They, yes, it is, it is. You lose a species if you lose the genetic viability. And that's actually one of the main challenges we have at Proyecto TT. We are just starting now to uh, study with partners that are, have that expertise, study the genetics of cotton tops. At the moment, it hasn't been studied yet. So that is one, one of our challenges into the future with regards to research to understand their genetics and be able to manage the populations in the future when we have more forests. So we're kind of going like in parallel, uh, building forest and learning about the genetics so that when the time comes, we can manage those, you know, large populations and make sure they stay safe. Right now, there's no knowledge about it, but it, it is a big risk. Yes, it is. You are totally right. Yeah. So well, Rosamira, I think that now we're passing to the fun fact section. Yay. What can you tell us <laughs> about the fun facts of this? Super beautiful species. This little guy is very special. It is this. This is the size about it, right? This is a one-pound monkey. That's it. Oh it's about goodness. the size of a squirrel. If you haven't seen a squirrel, that's about the size of cotton tops. And of course, this hair is what makes him really different from other uh, other tamarind species. There are quite a few in South America, but this one is only found in Colombia. That makes it very special. And this one is the only one that has the coolest hair in <laughs> all his relatives. <laughs> but, you know, besides the, the size difference, something fun about cotton tops is that they're just like us. They live like us, mom, dad, and the kids, you know, just like a family group for us. And when the kids get, you know, older and juvenile, they find another mate and they go away just like we do. <laughs> to start their own families. and to They start their own family somewhere else. They find their own home and they create their family there. And just like, just like we do. They're very territorial, just like us. You know, you don't let people that you don't know or that you don't invite into your home. Mm, you kind of like, no, this is only my family, my friends. And they're like that. They're just like really protective of their own, just like we are, and of their territory. And they also have um, a lot of uh, a communication system that is made out of vocalizations, like more than 30, just like our language. Okay. They communicate when they're hungry, when they're bored, when they want to rest, when they're, when they're scared. They have a high pitch sound that when they want to say, hey, this is my home, go away. They all have those beautiful vocalizations that our team has learned to identify really, really well. 
when, you know, because of, of the long-term studies of, of the species. But then, then you see cotton tops have a lot of similarities to humans, but they also have a very important role in the, in the forest. So they feed mostly from fruits, lots of fruits that, you know, bloom in the trees. And then, uh, gosh, I would say more than 60 species is what we have recorded. Wow. And they swallow the whole fruit. And when they poop, that seed of the fruit comes out without the outer layer and it comes ready to germinate. So as they move within the forest, within their territory, they poop quite a few times a day, I have to say. <laughs> but they're planting trees every time. And a big percentage of those trees come out and wow. keep the forest healthy and renewed. Absolutely. So that is a very important role to have in a forest. They, they feed from the forest, but they also help to keep it safe. Of course. Actually, I was reading that a good part of, I mean, like you mentioned the seed dispersal, that they are, they are one of the main seed dispersers in, in, the, in their forest, in their area. And That's actually, true. they cover like the, the position of bats, you know, that in other forests, bats are the main seed dispersers. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't know that some monkey species could also be a seed dispersers uh, or have such a rate of seed dispersal, you know? Yes. And also, very interesting thing. I didn't expect it. They were so small, you know? <laughs> yeah, they are very small. <laughs> in the photos, they look quite like bigger, but in real life, they, if it is like... They are, the, they are small. They are small. And, and that's actually, Fabrizio, one of the... Uh, the, 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 the most common anecdotes when like when our supporters come to visit or friends of the project or colleagues come to visit, because I, I when I give presentations, I show these beauty shots, close ups, and then they, in the screen, they look huge. But then when they see, they go like, that's it? That's it? Is it? Yes. Oh my God, they're so little. <laughs> and yes, they're so little. And it happened to me actually when I went to see them in the wild because it's different to see them on an exhibit at the zoo that the scale is different. But when you see them in this huge, beautiful forest up in the trees, it's like, what? You know? <laughs> so, so yeah. yes, they are, they are very small. And, and yes, like you were saying, they're very important to see this person, especially because they, their diet is very wide, very, very diff many different species. So they help with a lot of, of tree species. And that has been very important as well, Fabrizio, because we have learned so much about what they eat that now that we're doing restoration to bring back the forest, we collect seeds from those species and those are the ones that we plant the most. So wow. that that forest, when it grows, it has food and shelter for cotton tops. So all the research we have done, it's so useful not only for science, but for its conservation. So that's, that's something very important to highlight because sometimes people spend many years researching and they do publications and share the information, but the information is never used to conserve the species. Exactly. And, and that we've made a huge effort to everything we learn, we try to use it as a strategy for protecting the species. And seed dispersal and the seeds and planting those trees our nursery has 37 species out of the many others that cotton tops consume, but we make sure that when those trees grow, it'll give them food and shelter because they usually sleep on the larger trees, the bigger trees, just to keep safe from predators. So well, it is very, it's very cool. You know, Rosamira, what you mentioned should be the focus or the strategy of most conservation groups or NGOs because if you research and you learn new things about the species you work with, you work work with, but you don't apply it, then you know if there's no species, there's nothing else to research. Am I yes, am I right? Exactly. Well. You're right, and that's exactly why why our conservation model, it, it, you know, it's integrated. So you know, we do research research that is used. Uh, for the species, but we do education and use all that knowledge to teach other people and then come up with projects where communities can be involved and have 
their basic needs, but also help conserve. And then we do forest restoration where we involve communities as well. And then we do also awareness, you know? So you, you try to go in all fronts in, in try to tackle all threats that cotton top has, which is mostly deforestation and capture for the pet trade. And, and that all that, it goes to help that. So yes, I agree. Conservation needs uh, applying of all the knowledge and experiences, learned lessons, failures, everything into new strategies that are more effective. Yes, it is. It, it really needs it. And, yeah. and well, I, I hope that some other conservation projects follow your, your method, because I got to say, with all that you've mentioned, you, you are one of the most complete conservation NGOs I have interviewed or I have had <laughs> an interview with. Thank you, Fabrizio. And it is really nice. I mean, I, and that's why I love to participate and talk to you and, and to people that are interested because we hope that our experience helps other organizations or whatever has worked with us, uh, uh, for us can be used. And also whatever hasn't worked, you know, because then you kinda, you're more effective if you know that these strategies don't work and these ones work or depending where you are, you can use it. So yes, it's, it's value. And, and we do it, you know, open sharing so that everybody can benefit from that, from these experiences, can use it in their own conservation work. Exactly. That's great, Rosamira. Yeah. Well, now I think that we are passing to the part of threats and conservation. Yeah. What are the main threats that this species faces? Yeah, so the forestation for cattle ranching and agriculture is like the huge uh, threat. So we're down to 2% of what there used to be in Northern Colombia. And those activities are traditional, these large uh, open areas for cattle ranching. Changing that format has been tough, but we're on, on the right track, I think. And the second threat is capture for the pet trade. You see this beautiful animal and people think that it's cool to have it as a pet at home. So they get hunted by local communities that sell them and that's a way that they generate an income. And then people have them at their homes and then they get all troubled with it and then they don't know what to do with it. And then that becomes a huge problem in all ends. So what we do is research, as I mentioned before, to understand the challenges. We're protecting and restoring the forest, which is the main threat. Little by little, we go adding more areas that are protected for cotton tops and connecting through corridors of forest uh, but then we do have a big social component, which is educating in schools of the areas where we work in these rural areas. We have permanent education program. And then the main challenge, which is people cutting trees and hunting animals for an income. Then actually these beautiful cotton tops are made by local artisans that have learned to make them and that helps them with their economies. Same, they also do tote bags with uh, recycled plastic bags. Um, and, um, and the farmers do the crops uh, with, you know, the conservation agreements. So finding these alternatives where people can get involved, help conservation and benefit themselves with a stable income, it's key. And that has been a huge, uh, it's a huge challenge, but huge accomplishments as well. So again, as I was mentioning before, we try to make it, you know, multidisciplinary and our team is multidisciplinary to try to tackle from those different um, from those different uh, ends right very impressive to hear and by the way Rosamira I was reading that the situation of the pet trade with the cotton top tamarind has been worsening am I right what, what can you it's tell terrible me? It's terrible and, and unfortunately it is not paid enough attention because in, in countries in Latin America, like Colombia, we have so many conflicts, so many issues, you know, health, education, the political conflict, corruption, lots of things that people pay a lot of attention to. And then, you know, the pet trade is, is one of the most disturbing businesses around the world, not only in Colombia, all over the place, but but, you know, they're just animals, people say, you know, we, we need to focus on humans. 
and nothing can be more wrong than than just have that view. Uh, but then that's why uh, you know calling attention to these species is such a huge uh, challenge. Um, and then understanding metrics, understanding putting controls. Environmental authorities have legally the responsibility of controlling, confiscating, managing confiscated populations. But unfortunately, they usually don't have the right tools. They usually don't have, you know, they, they don't do it because it becomes a problem to them. Because once you come, once you take out a cotton top from the forest, and you domesticate it, they cannot go back to the wild. It's, it's almost impossible that they go back to the wild because of many risks that, you know, that they can pose to the wild populations. So they have to be either kept on a zoo or on, on a conservation center, or on a rescue center. And there's not too many to hold these animals. So sometimes they irresponsibly release them wherever, you know, putting at risk all other wild populations, or they get so disturbed that they end up at farms, you know, while they live and just keep, just keep them in there. So that's why we focus so much on prevention. It's like having kids and people in the communities understand they're happy in the forest. They just leave them there. If you want to have a pet, have a dog, have a cat. Those are animals that need our care and that exactly. you know, stay with us, stay with us and, and have a lot of benefits for us, emotional and, you know, and, and many. Yeah, and, of course. So, so those are the animals we need to have as a pet. But cotton tops really have it, have it really harsh when they're at home. They cannot be with their families. They cannot eat what they, what is, what's healthy for them. They cannot behave the way they naturally behave. So that's part of actually of our education programs. We, we try to change roles and have a kid get lost in the forest and miss his family or her family. Food, shelter. He's like, wow, that feels horrible. Yes, that's, that's how cotton tops feel horrible. when you bring him at your home. You know, you're, you're happy at your home with your family. They let them be happy in their home with their family. But it's a huge, huge challenge that is not paid attention enough. So we have focused a lot of our education work on that, a lot of our, you know, research work on that, a lot of our of our awareness work is they're not pets, leave them in the forest, they're happy in the forest, they're critically endangered, they need our help, and keep continuing sending those messages to just kind of, you know, kind of learn, uh, uh, like, kind of like light a spark in people to understand that that hurts an animal. And that's why we need to tackle the wildlife trade everywhere because yeah yes. the, the, this thing is only causing because that's another thing for example if i go somewhere and i see a person that has a cotton top as pet oh i want a cotton top too and then i go buy <laughs> yes. it and then yes. comes another person i also want that and, yeah. and you know it, it is trying to, exactly like you said educating the people yes. to see that it is not correct to have mm -hmm. A uh, wild animal in your home is starting by that. Not only cotton tops, but any wild animal. Any, any wild animals, yeah. And, and understand that it hurts the animal and that it hurts the environment. Understand why. Because like what you were saying, Fabrizio, many people, sometimes people buy the animals from traffickers because out of pity, you know, it's like poor animal, it's tied by a rope here or yeah. it looks sad and they drug him. So they look tame. And then when they get to your home, they're all aggressive, right? Oh and they buy it thinking that they're helping. So that's another message we're trying to deliver is like, don't buy it. If you buy it, the trafficker doesn't care why you buy it. They go with that money, feed their families, but then go and hunt another one. Exactly. So let's try to find other solutions for people and avoid at all. And, and also social, like social condemning, you know, it's like, you should, you know, you should not, that's not good. So, you know, we have gotten more and more reports of people, you know, kind of like uh, saying, hey, there's a cotton top here, there's a cotton top there. And we're working with authorities to sort things out, but it's a huge challenge. And um, that's why we focus our energy on preventing, preventing and educating. Hopefully in the long term, that will be more effective than, than what you see now, right? Exactly. By the yes. way, Rosamira, something that I think we have not talked about on today's interview is the biomedical research. Mm. 
if I'm correctly, before 1976, when CETES declared the cotton top tamarind uh, an endangered species and then banned all international trade, there were thousands of cotton top tamarinds exported to biomedical research facilities around the world. What can That's you true. tell me about it? Well, they, this happened in the 60s and 70s. The number that the bibliography says is in anywhere between 30,000 animals, 30 to 40,000 animals were exported from Colombia to biomedical research institutions in the United States. Uh, uh, it was related to colon cancer. For some reason, they, they realized that cotton tops develop spontaneously colon cancer, supposedly, and they wanted to use them as a... As a, as a, as a as a species to find a cure for find colon cure. cancer. But I believe what happened is that little after that, you know, you, you got AIDS and, and a bunch of other, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, conditions that, that called the attention of researchers. And this never led to anything. And all those animals ended up in zoos and conservation centers around the world. And that's why cotton tops are so popular in zoos. They reproduce well in captivity. So if you keep them at zoos, then people see them quite often and never realize how endangered they, their counterpart are in the wild. Exactly. And you see them in Europe, you see them in the United States and Latin America. And actually some of those zoos are great supporters of our work and great awareness creation with the animals in the captivity and help our efforts in the wild. But fortunately, it was banned and it hasn't been an issue anymore. Uh, and we have all those ambassadors around the world uh, calling attention to these amazing little species and, uh, and, uh, and supporting our work. And, and, but hopefully, Rosamira, um, thanks. Well, I, I will not say thanks, but <laughs> after all of those poor monkeys exported, to the biomedical research facilities. Yeah. Now there's a big captive breeding program in mm -hmm. Europe, in North America. Of course, as you mentioned, it's very sad that if I see them in all the zoos I go, I think that they are not endangered because they are common. Mm -hmm. While in reality, they do are. Because yeah. if we see common species in zoos, for example, there are meerkats, there are... Mm -hmm. um, common marmosets and mm -hmm. and all of that and most of the species are least concerned or near threatened but this species is critically endangered in reality mm -hmm. so so yeah. exactly uh, and it's good it's good to have that genetic pole outside of the country just in case anything happens in the future exactly. hopefully not hopefully we do have a genetic reserve and actually the research that is being conducted is with animals in museums, animals in zoos, and hopefully animals in the wild. That will be a lot of good information to plan in the long term. So exactly. yes, lots of exciting work around the species. Incredible, Rosamira. <laughs> well, we are approaching the end of this interview. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't want to end it really. <laughs> but first, I would like to ask you, what are the plans for the future? What Project OTT has for the future to keep protecting this species, to keep raising awareness, and to keep inspiring more young people? Yes, we have, we have found uh, forest restoration and forest conservation to be, to be the, what's gonna be guiding our efforts in the future because it has a direct impact in the species, having more habitat and connected habitat. And it has benefit on people because you have better climate, better conditions. And with these conservation agreements, you can provide for your family without damaging the forest. So our hope is to expand this model to other areas where cotton tops are still present. And maybe in 10 years or 15 years, make, you know, be sure that the populations are stable and that you know, we can just manage instead of you know, being on a crisis constantly with the threats that we're facing. That's our, our hope. So we hope to protect more forests, to plant more forests, to involve more communities, and of course, continue educating on and on uh, until it is you know, in a, in a second nature to understand that this is a, a very a special species that is worth our care and our protection. And the great thing, Fabrizio, is like protecting the forest for cotton tops 
you're protecting the forest from many other wildlife species. It's not only exactly. cuttatops. Cuttatops are the symbol. But then you have macaws, sloth bears, deer, reptiles, birds, you know, wide variety of animals that benefit from us protecting that forest. So we're actually saving an ecosystem. And saving that ecosystem is good for people too. We save water, better climate, resources, if they're managed sustainably. So it's good for everybody. So it's, what's good for the monkeys is good for cotton tops, for the people as well. <laughs> exactly. So that's the message. That's the message. What's good for the monkeys is good for the animals, is good for people. And that's what we want to convey and communicate and grow into that in the near future. Great. <coughs> that's great to hear. And not only that, but I hope you can continue doing all of this because really, as you said, you are protecting an entire ecosystem and you are benefiting all the people living around it. And yes, well, it's simply awesome to, to see you doing this. Thank you for it. I Thank imagine you. that your inspiring message was that one, that if it benefits the monkey, it benefits <laughs> the people. Yeah, Great. that's important. That's important because a lot of people ask, well, what if the monkey disappears? Well, it, it, it hurts us as well. So we have to find that balance. Yes. Exactly. Awesome. Well, Rosamira, again, thanks a lot for being here. It is incredible to have you a pleasure for me to to meet you <laughs> and to have this talk with you and i hope that in the future we can have more talks not only about the current tamarind but about the other colombian endangered fauna of course of course Arisa, thank you for giving giving us the opportunity to share our stories i want to invite your audience to connect with us through our social media uh, at project tt or just watch <laughs> beautiful videos on our YouTube uh, channel, Proyecto TT, and our website, proyectott.com. If you want to learn, if you want to contact us, if you want to support our work, we're here for you to give you more information. You want to have these beautiful monkeys cool. instead of the real ones, you can contact us or check our website. And uh, always love to share and interact. Thank you, Fabrizio. I look forward to staying in touch and to staying connected and hopefully continue to share more stories, exciting stories in the near future. Thanks, Rosamira, me too. Good luck with your, with, your, uh, with your interviews. You're doing a great job. Such a young individual, so interested and well-informed. Congratulations to you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rosamira. <laughs> and, and well, before we go, yes, I leave you the website, the link to the social media and the YouTube channel in the links down below. And also, don't forget to subscribe, like, and well, share the video. This needs, we need to keep raising awareness and we need to get to more people to do so. So stay right. tuned, more interviews coming soon. Bye. Bye-bye.